you'll agree you could keep studying this man's life, I think, for weeks, months on end. There's so much uh, in this story. And as there's been a lot of conversation this weekend, which has been really the objective, which is fantastic. And I think it, it goes to show that we read the Bible, as someone said on the weekend, we read the Bible uh, comparative to where we are in our life at the time. And, and the beautiful thing about the scripture is it is one book that was put together to fit all the generations and all the circumstances that all those generations would find themselves in. So even with stories like this, Samson, we will sit with a, a certain lens on Samson depending on where we are in our life. And, and that's certainly come out from all the discussion that we've um, been able to have together this weekend. So this morning, uh, our intention is to complete the story. And he is a wonderful character in the Bible, isn't he? And there's absolutely no doubt, chapter 16 is the culmination now of all of his challenges uh, coming together. The Philistines have learned a lot about this man over 20 years. And over this period of time of judgment, they've collated all those things, they've learned about the destroyer of their country, and now they're going to deploy them. And they're going to use one of the, the greatest people that, that is recorded in Scripture, really, in, in, in many ways. Infamous person that she is. In fact, there's, there's three people that share very similar characteristics inside the Old Testament, and Delilah is one of them. The first would have to be Potiphar's wife. Second would be Jezebel. And, of course, we have Delilah this morning. And And we won't go into detail as to how they intertwine, but just think and cast your mind back to those women in Scripture and the impact that they had on the people around them. And Samson is not going to be any different. And there was a man years later, Solomon, who would write in Proverbs chapter 7 some very interesting things about people just like this. And we won't read all of Proverbs 7, but we will open with a a couple of words from it. In Proverbs 7, he says, My son, you keep my words and my my commandments. And he said, I'll tell you why. Over in verse 5, he says, These commandments and words, he said, They will keep you from the strange woman, the stranger which flattereth with her words. And we've seen on more than one occasion that this is what got to Samson. His first wife pressed him and vexed him with her words, remember, day after day after day. And he goes on and he describes just what what will happen if we don't um, guard our ears and our hearts from these strange words. He said we we become like young young ones, void of understanding in verse 7. And he goes on and he paints this picture of a young man out in the street. And there is a woman with her words, watching this young man from, from her casement window. And Solomon, uh, who, who surely is, is educated enough and experienced enough to talk on these things with all the trouble that he got himself into, he says it's like a young person, void of understanding and in the twilight and in the evening and in the black and dark of night. Four ways to describe the night in one verse. Hadn't, hadn't Samson been there? And, and, he, and he goes on to say, she lies in wait at every corner. And eventually this young man that would walk the streets dark at night, void of understanding, not knowing how much danger he was in, she would come along and it says in verse 13, and she would catch him by the face. And she would look into his face and say, I have peace offerings with me. She would say, I have found you. In other words, it meant that she would make this man feel like she'd been looking for him his whole life. And he would just stare into her face. I have found you. I have perfumed my bed. Come and let us take our fill of love till morning. And in verse 21, with her much fair speech, the very warning that Solomon gives, she causes him to yield. And he, in verse 22, goes straight after her. You know what Solomon describes him as? Like an ox that goes to the slaughter. And he runs down that race and up the ramp. 
not knowing that on the other side of that door is death. He knows not, in verse 23, that the spot that he finds himself in is for his life. And that is where we find Samson in Judges chapter 16. And how do we know that? Well, you open there in verse 4, and it came to pass afterward that he loved a woman. You know, it's, it's never said of anyone else in this story that Samson loved them like this woman. It's not said of anyone else, not even of his wife. He is in love. He looks into that face and he sees a woman that he loves, it says, in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. Now, if you wanted to know what sort of person this was, just quickly skip over in a few verses in chapter 16 and put together in your mind the picture of influence that she has. Do you know, during this story, she has a direct line to the five most powerful people in all of that country, the lords of the Philistines. In fact, they ring her and when she wants something, they come running. She is highly, highly influential. She's exceptionally wealthy and particularly after this story. She cleans up real good from those five lords of the Philistines. She has this ability to persuade and coerce Samson like no one else in his life. And isn't it ironic, the bookends of his life, the two women, he had his mother who separated herself to God and would hedge him round about and train him and bring him up. And then he comes up against this woman on the other end of his life. Who will stop at nothing to pull down everything that's ever done? Find me, she, uh, he would say. You try this and you try that. She would say, what would happen if I bind you? The word means to yoke or hitch. And he's already yoked to his God, isn't he? The, that separation on his head and she's there pulling the other way saying, I'm going to bind you to me. I'm going to take you away. This is the challenge. The two women that bookended his life. And here he is and he's staring into his eyes. And look where he is. He's in the valley of Sorek. And the divine irony is not lost in this verse. The valley of Sorek. Sorek means the choicest vine of all things. So there he is. He's in the valley of Sorek, the choicest vine. And on his head is a symbol of the unpruned vine. And all the messages are coming right there. And he's sit staring into the eyes of a woman named Delilah, whose name means that, that which hangs down, almost like the vine. There's vine everywhere, isn't it? The symbol of separation. He is in all sorts of trouble now because he loves her. And he's just going to listen to her. She will prevail. because She has his heart. And the lords of the Philistines, it says, came up to her and said unto her, Entice him and see wherein his great strength lies and by what means we might prevail against him that we might bind him. There it is. To afflict him and, and we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. The lords of the Philistines come to her. Now there's some suggestion that she may be a, a Hebrew just like Samson. And that, that suggestion is made because during chapter 16, she constantly refers to the Philistines as the Philistines. Samson, the Philistines are upon thee. A difference to the, the woman of Timnath that he married who would say that these are the children of my people. So she very much owned the Philistines as her people, whereas Delilah never does that. And, and perhaps... That they're going to use Delilah in this way because she could build that trust and that, that, that almost that, that faux love with Samson, that they could exploit that because she was one of his people. We don't know. Either way, she has great influence because the lords of the Philistines come to her and they say entice him. That word entice is to open up. And this is what the Philistines wanted to do. They gave the same charge to the woman of Timnath, and at the wedding they said, you go and entice him, you open him up so we can work him out. 
What do they want to know? They want to see where in his great strength lies. They had not worked it out. That, of course, is also always a good talking point about how big Samson was and whether people could look at him and, and suggest that his strength came from uh, the size of the person that he was. And I guess they never kind of worked it out. It, obviously, he wasn't 10 foot tall and, and rippling muscles. I, I kind of think he probably looked something like me, actually. <laughs> they couldn't work it out. And they say, say it a number of times down in verse 9. So his strength was not known. Uh, verse 15. These three times thou hast not told me wherein thy great strength lies. So it was a mystery. And that's what they wanted to know. And they said to her, we want to know wherein his great strength lies and how we can overcome him so that we might afflict him. They weren't backward in coming forward. They knew what they wanted to do. You see the margin says they want to humble him. They want to humble the boy. And look at the reward. And we will give thee, every one of us, 1,100 pieces of silver. Now, this is what you call all the bets being, all the stops being pulled out. 1,100 pieces of silver, young people. He had already, many years before, destroyed their economy. They're only just starting to rebuild. And now they're going to get all the money they can and do it on one big bet, and that's Delilah. 1,100 pieces of silver. It's a bit difficult to work out exactly what it, what it perhaps would have been, but over in, in, in chapter 17, 10 shekels by the year in verse 10 seems to be, of Judges 17 verse 10, seems to be about the standard year's wage, which would mean that 5 by 1100 is 550 odd years salary. In other words, by today's standards, it could be upwards of 15 or 20 million dollars. In other Whatever we believe, it's more than likely going down and pulling everything out of the bank that those five lords of the Philistines had and placing it in the lap of Delilah. That's how confident they were that she could get the job done. That is an enormous amount of money. Do you know what, though? She's not interested in money. She's not just interested in money. You watch how the story unfolds. So she takes on this challenge and in verse 6, And Delilah said to Samson, Tell me, I pray thee, wherein thy great strength lies and wherein thou might be bound to afflict thee. I always find this period of his life quite interesting because the way it's written, it stacks these events one after the other. It's almost like each night she asks him and the Philistines jump on him and then the next night she asks him again. And, and very clearly it wouldn't have happened like that. There's a long that there would be long periods of time between these challenges on his strength and her prying away uh, at, at trying to work out where his secret is. You see, he has a great problem because over in verse 16, it's in order to paint the picture properly, you jump forward to, to verse 16 and it says, and it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words. So we can draw perhaps the assumption from that that Samson lived with Delilah. The only way that she's going to get access to him every single day is if they're living together. And here's a greater problem that he's got. She's trying to yoke and hitch him to her way of thinking, to her, to her life. And she's very close to succeeding as the story builds. And now she wants to know, she asks him, where is it? What will we have to do? In order to afflict you, where does it lie? And Samson in verse 7 said, If you bind me or yoke me, as the word means, with seven green widths that were never dried, then I shall be weak and as an ordinary man, as the word means. I'll be like anyone else. But you notice what he's done there? He gives the first clue. He just lets his guard drop just that little bit. He never let his guard drop with his wife, did he? At his own wedding, no way in the world. But he does here. Seven green widths. The seven. The covenant number. It's appeared all the way through the story, hasn't it? 
He knows that it's there. The seven green widths. Then the lords of the Philistines brought to her seven green widths. You see that? These are the rulers. This is the, the upper echelon of government, government in this time. And they come and personally deliver to her these green widths, which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. And in verse 9, now there were men lying awake, abiding in the chamber with her. And however the, the, the house was set up, undoubtedly she's managed to hide a certain number of soldiers and is clearly here in, in full expectation that these green widths are going to work. Seven green widths, all these cords tied up. And she'd cause you to fall asleep and they'd be there together and she'd be able to tie them all up full of confidence and she's hidden these men abiding with her in the chamber and she says unto him, Samson, uh, sorry, the Philistines be upon thee, Samson. And we know the story. He breaks the wits as a thread of tow when it touches the fire or smells the fire as a margin, just like taking a bit of string and just moving it near a flame and it would just fall away so easily. He pulls his arms out so his strength was not known. Can you imagine what it was like to be one of those soldiers in that room? And you're told that this is definitely going to work. And you're talking in your mind, you're thinking about a guy that has literally knocked off thousands of your mates. And now you've got to jump out there in the middle of the night and have all confidence to go and grab him. And you'd run in there and she'd make a great raucous and you'd run in and he'd stand up and do that and you'd turn around, I reckon, you'd be out the door in an instant. And his strength's not known. Now here is the key in verse 10 to this woman. Have a look. And Delilah said unto Samson, Behold, you have mocked me. You've mocked me and you've told me lies. This is actually her problem. Delilah is not a woman that is used to being lied to. She does the manipulation, no one else to her. And she's devastated that he would do that. You have lied to me, she says. Now tell me, I pray thee, wherewith thou might be bound. You tell me. And you can imagine that conversation. of Those two people come together in that house. And she'd look at him and she's, she's starting that emotional card, that emotional blackmail. You lied straight to my face. And there's Samson. He, this gets him every single time. It would claw away at his heart. Sorry, I... I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to. She said, no, you tell me. You don't make a mockery of me in front of other people. She's got every bit of her reputation relying on this deal, to get this over the line. Not only does she stand to make a lot of money, but she has the five most powerful people in all of the nation ringing her and placing great expectation on her. She needs to deliver and it won't happen when she's being mocked in her own house. And he says unto her, if they bind me fast with new ropes that were never occupied or never, knew, never used, then I'll be like an ordinary man, as it means. And she does that. And of course, the Philistines are upon thee, Samson, and the liars in wait were abiding in the chamber, and he break off them, off his arm, just like thread. The same thing happens. And what's the first thing that Delilah says to Samson in verse 13? Hitherto you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me where thou might be with sorry, wherewith thou might be bound. And he said unto her, If thou weavest the seven locks of my head with the web. You see, he gives up a little more now. Not only is it seven green wits that if you tied me up, but now, now he alludes to his hair the symbol of that covenant that he's got with his God, the symbol of separation. And as she is trying ever so slightly and incrementally to bind him and yoke him to one way of life, he's already yoked to another. And now he alludes to that. It's in my hair. If you weave the seven locks, seven, the covenant number of my head into the web, and she fastened it, it says, with the pin into the, into a, a, a contraption that would be used to make um, different garments or rugs or clothing. And she, and, and she takes 
her hair and fastens it in with a pin. And she says unto him, The Philistines be upon thee. And he awakened out of his sleep and went away with the pin of the beam and with the web. The whole insides of this contraption came away with his hair. How on earth she got him into a position to be able to put his hair in the first place into that? But she managed it. And then she really starts in verse 15. Have a look. How can you say, I love you when your heart is not with me? You see, she pinpoints the problem. How can you say that you love me and I don't have what's in here? You have mocked me three times and you have not told me where your great strength lies. You imagine the performance that was put on. The tears and pulling at every bit of his heartstrings. How can you say that you love me? The intense conversation inside that bedroom late at night, staring into each other's eyes, would just claw away at Samson's heart. And it came to pass when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him so that his soul was vexed unto death. Vexed unto death. Up to a point it was killing him. Every single day she would ask him. Every single day she would hold him ransom for his emotions and the way he felt about her. Every single day. You know, you pause that moment right there and who does that remind you of in the Old Testament? Reminds you of Joseph, doesn't it? It says exactly the same thing of Potiphar's wife. She saw something that she wanted. A handsome young man, blessed of God, who had everything in Potiphar's house house in his hand and she would press him daily, press him daily. She set circumstances inside that house where it was only him and her by themselves and she would corner him and she would press herself. It would be physical upon Joseph and the two men at two different periods of time face exactly the same type of trial, exactly the same type of woman. Both men that are separated to God by time and circumstance. And yet they both react very, very differently, don't they? Because we know the story of Joseph in that he turns around and he flees idolatry, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians. And he leaves his coat right there. He runs out of the room. And what happens here? That he told her all his heart. And in the end, that constant wearing away could not possibly be kept off by Samson. And he tells her everything. And you know, in, in Micah chapter 7 and verse 5, it says these words, Trust ye not in a friend, put ye not confidence in a God. He says, keep the doors of thy mouth from her that lies in your bosom. He says, you watch your mouth from her that lies in your bosom, in your bed. And that's where they are, right there. And she finally gets to him and he told her all his heart. There has not come a razor on my head. For I have been separated unto God from my mother's womb. He knew full well, didn't he? He says, if I be shaven, then my strength will go from me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. And was it really true, brothers and sisters? Was it really true that it was all tied up in his hair or was it what it symbolised? Of course it was. It was that symbolisation of being separated and called out to God, wasn't it? And he says, my strength will go and I will be like any other person. And do you know what's happened here, brothers and sisters? In, in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and, and verse 4, uh, it's a little quote that you would know very, very well and you don't need to turn it up. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 says these words, which were spoken to Israel. It says in verse 4, Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. Wasn't that what they were told to do? And here's a man that's separated to that God. And he was called to do exactly the same thing. And yet, do you know what he's done here? What he's done is he's replaced the God in his life. This is why his challenges are going to become 
so much worse now because what she does is she presses him daily with her words so much so that his soul, there it is, love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul. She gives him his soul. That he told her all his heart, there it is, two out of three. Now he offers up to her and in the end, with all thy heart, with all thy soul. And now as he lays in her lap, he offers up the secret to his strength. And the very thing that Israel was told to give to God, he gives to Delilah. You know what the very next verse says? And these words which I have commanded thee this day shall be in thine heart. And she had his heart, didn't he? From the very beginning. God, brothers and sisters, is no longer number one in Samson's life. It's Delilah, has every part of it. And you know what? She knows it. And when Delilah saw, you see, Delilah could tell that she'd won. She could tell that she had him. And when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines. And she says, come up this once, for he has showed me everything. She could see into his eyes that he just laid out everything that she wanted to know. The relief would wash over Samson because she had pressed him daily. He showed me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up unto her and brought the money in their hands. Look at the power of it. She's won. She's endured mockery for this. And she would pick that phone up and say, you come now and bring your money with you. He showed me everything. This new supreme confidence comes over the, over the telephone through to the five lords of the Philistines. Supremely confident with the information she's got. And they come running. Have a look in verse 19. And she made him sleep upon her knees. That word sleep there, similar word used for when Adam slept. A deep, deep sleep. Of almost like a, a man relieved that his wife would just stop going at him the whole time, pressing him every single day. And she makes him sleep upon her knees. And she called for a man and she caused him to shave off the seven locks of his head what a moment that is brothers and sisters he has protected that and been told to protect that for as long as he's been alive and now he finally yields doesn't he wasn't that what Solomon said would happen in Proverbs chapter 7 later on he'd refer to that very thing with her much fair speech she causes him to yield and that's what he does is he falls asleep on, his, on her knees there with his head in the lap. And along would come a man and he would hold up the great seven locks. And while he's in the deepest of sleep, would take those scissors and cut it straight off. Do you know, brothers and sisters, do you know what would happen with your hair? the symbol of your separation. In the Nazarite vow, in Numbers chapter 6, what you would do in verse 18, it says in the Nazarite, this is at the time that you would finish your period of separation in verse 18, shall shave off of his, uh, shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tabernacle and shall take the hair of his separation and put it in the fire, which is, under the sacrifice of the peace offerings. They would lift that sacrifice up and put that hair under there. It would be offered up to God in a symbol of the, the, the completion of that period of time. They would take it and they would offer it up right there at the door of the tabernacle and he's offered his up to Delilah. Laying there on his knees, she comes along and takes his separation. And look what she does next. She takes the seven locks and began to afflict him and his strength went from him. His heart had belonged to someone else now and his strength was gone. 
Can you imagine her taunting him? Oh, this is why she's in this game. It's not for the money. It's for the victory. She's been mocked and mocked and mocked and lied to. She's had behavior exhibited to her. She doesn't ever put up with, and now she's won. Can you imagine her holding his face? Oh, what's wrong? And he would do that. As he, as he woke up, he'd grab his hair, and he'd realize that it's gone. He'd see it laying on the ground. Big matted mess of seven locks that had never been touched his whole life, probably down to here. It's all laying on the ground. And look what he says. As she says to him, Samson, the Philistines be upon thee. And he woke up out of his sleep. And he said, I will go out at, uh, as at other times before and shake myself. And this is how Samson saw himself because that word shake there means to rustle the mane. So it's almost like he thought, I will get up and, and like a lion, I will roar like I do to these people. And he went to shake his great mane of hair and it wasn't there. And he didn't know that God had departed from him. And the Philistines grabbed him. Imagine what that felt like for this man. The first time in two decades, he didn't have the strength. And they grabbed hold of him and he'd go to push back and realize he was as what he'd been quoting, an ordinary man. This is what it felt like to be ordinary. And in type, a great wave of those things that represent sin and everything that he would fight against just jumped straight on him and flattened him into the ground. He'd never felt it before. Flattened him into the ground. And they grabbed him and they took him, it says, and we know the story. They put out his eyes and brought him down to Gaza. It was a horrendous practice back in those times, wasn't it? The last king of Judah had his eyes put out in 2 Kings 25 and verse 7. It was done by many different uh, methods. And you can research it, young people. I encourage you to go and research it. <laughs> it's quite interesting to have a look at. It's gory. But they'd either burn them out of your head or they'd just use an implement and just put it in the corner of your eye and just pop it out against your own skull. And the thing would come out and just pull the cord out. See you later. Your whole eye out or just cauterize it in the top of your head. That's what they used to do. And they used to, to, they used to get these, whether it would be kings or important people, and they would do heinous acts to their own families as the last thing they ever saw with their eyes and they'd push them out. And isn't it incredible, brothers and sisters, that the man whose name means brilliant sunlight is now plunged into darkness. Plunged into darkness and they would put out his eyes and bring him to Gaza. And what would they say? What would they say as they bring him down to Gaza with great big black holes in his head where his eyes were? And he's bound, it says, and they bind him with fetters of brass, double brass, it means. That means hands and feet. The very things that he did with his hands got him where he was and the very path that he trod with his feet got him where he was. He's bound now by what, the, what brass represents, which is the flesh in, around his hands and his feet. He's all bound up. And where are they leading him through? Back through, he's walking through the gates of his enemies. And they'd grab him and they'd scream in his ear, you know where you're going, don't you? You're walking through the gates that you took. We've rebuilt them. And they're stronger than ever. I'd like to see you take these with no eye. There's no way he's going to be able to do that. Is there? They're all bound up. And he did grind in the prison house. Look at the irony in that. You know, Samson had destroyed their economy and in chapter 15 and verse 5, every bit of food, years before. And look what he does now. Bound up by the flesh, he feeds his enemies. He feeds them. You know, under the Lord in, in uh, Exodus chapter 22, if you accidentally burnt down your neighbor's crops, you had to feed them. Great irony, isn't it? You had to pay all of that back. That's what he's doing here. He burnt all the corn to the ground and now he's feeding them. How be it, it says, 
the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaved. And as someone rightly said yesterday, and we had a great night last night listening with the young people to a, an uh, audio play, a period of time here for Samson to stop and reflect on his life. We don't know how long it was, long enough for his hair to begin to grow again. But you can imagine what it was like for this man, as it's, as it's depicted, going around and around in circles, feeding his enemy. Imagine how he felt. Imagine now, in the darkness that was his, his state of life, imagine as the clarity began to creep in, the messages. It's so often that, that we begin to see things clearly in the darkest, most difficult times of our life. It's the very reason they come, isn't it? We're told that in James chapter 1. James chapter 1 is so much that we can apply to this story in Samson. But a huge amount of it is about our trial and the difficulties that come on. And these, these trials are often brought about by our own doing, aren't they? By the, by the circumstances we get ourselves into. Have a look at what James says about the circumstance that Samson finds himself in. Every man is capable of being drawn away by his own lusts and enticed. There it is. But he's got to know and he's got to learn how to that God's going to work with him. And we're exactly the same. We have these times where it's deep and it's dark and it's difficult and we can't see. And yet after a period of time of reflection, we began to have a small amount of clarity. I believe that's what happened in Samson's life. And in verse 23, the lords of the Philistines gather them together for to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon their God and to rejoice. For they said, Our God has delivered our Samson, our enemy, into our hand. And when the people saw him, they praised their God. For they said, Our God hath delivered into our hands our enemy and the destroyer of our country, which slew many of us. Now, brothers and sisters, if you want to highlight anything in these couple of verses, have a look at the change, the change in conversation by the Philistines. The lords of the Philistines gather themselves together to offer a great sacrifice unto Dagon. Then they say, our God has delivered. When the people saw him, they praised their God. Our God has delivered. Later on in verse 24, you see what they've done? They haven't made this about their victory over Samson. They've done the worst thing that they could possibly do. And they have brought in God into the, the equation. And now they grab hold of Dagon, their God, and they face him off with Yahweh. And they bring the two into the arena. This has not got anything to do with Samson, nothing to do with the Philistines. They're now challenging God's supreme authority and control as the creator of all the universe. That's what they're doing. Let's get Samson here. We're going to offer a great sacrifice unto our God. Why? Because our God has delivered Samson into the hands, into our hands. We praise our God in verse 24. He has delivered into our hands the destroyer of our country. And now it changes, doesn't it? You don't think God's ears were all listening about what was going to happen here. He's a long way from leaving Samson. And it came to pass when their hearts were merry, mishteh, the same drinking feast, that Samson would, would get his friends uh, to, involved in it, his own wedding, the same as the young men used to do, as it says, back in chapter 13, uh, 14. Here they are, the young men are at it again when their hearts were merry and they said, call for Samson that he might make us sport. And they called for Samson out of the prison house. And he made them sport. And they set for him between the pillars. We, we, we can't quite understand what this must have been like for Samson. We can try. Incredibly difficult moment in this man's life. The great and mighty man is now kept perhaps underneath this city of Gaza, chained up, 
And every now and then he would be called to be, to be brought out. This man was somewhat of a legend in and amongst their community. They would teach their kids about this man that used to have incredible strength, that would overthrow armies. And you can imagine the stories of the, of the jawbone and the ass that only got bigger and bigger and bigger in Philistine folklore. And they would sit there and tell their, their, their children of a man that took out tens of thousands with, with his jawbone, not a thousand. It would grow and grow. And, then, and now they want to put a feast on and they would bring out this man that was once mighty with big charred uh, holes in his head where his eyes once were and they would poke fun at him. And it's not a small crowd either. You look down there in verse 27. On the roof there were about 3,000 men and women. And we don't know what the building looked like. I mean, paint your own picture in your mind. But quite often they would have a, like amphitheater type uh, seating on the roof. So there would be like an open court, perhaps the size of the hall here, and then all the way around up on another level, all the way around like that, you would be able to, there would be stacked seating. You'd be able to look down inside the area. Maybe much bigger than that. We don't know. There, inevitably, there's thousands of people here because he ends up killing more people in this one moment than he did in his whole life put together. And he put a few away. There's thousands there. And out he comes and they drag him up for sport. And look at it in verse 26. And Samson says to the lad that held him by the hand, look at that, the mightiest man of Israel, the strongest man that has ever lived, is led at the hands by a small boy. And he says, suffer me that I might feel the pillars upon the, where, where upon the house stands that I might lean upon them. And God specifically tells us in verse 27, now the house was full. You couldn't fit another person in there. And here they are at a big feast. And you can imagine the smell of food in, in, the, in the great open areas with all the fires and the coal, the coal fires all cooking those beautiful foods, the smell just wafting through, all the wine being spilt and drank everywhere. Thousands of people there, the music, the chanting. The Philistine behavior, which was abhor abhorred by the, by the surrounding nations. And there it is. He is smack bang in the middle of that. And he is front and center, their sport. And it says, in verse 28, And Samson called unto the Lord and said, O Lord God, remember me, I pray thee, and strengthen me. I pray thee only this once, O God, that I might be once avenged of the Philistines for mine eye. And here is the prayer from the heart of Samson. He's had time to stop and think about this moment. And when we started our studies, we remember we made the point that this life of separation, this vow of the Nazarite, this purpose that God sought occasion with the Philistines was given to Samson, wasn't it? And as his life moves through, remember the spirit of God comes mightily on Samson and it comes on Samson. And it comes on Samson time and time again. That spirit is given to him that he might fulfill that purpose. And for the first time in his life, brothers and sisters, he turns around and he asks for it. That's the circumstances in, in his life. He turns around and he looks up and he says, I pray thee, strengthen me. Never asked for it since yet, has he? And now he needs it. I need what you do in my life. He said, strengthen me, I pray this once, O God, that I might be avenged of my two eyes. And Samson, it says, takes hold of the two middle pillars on which the house stood, on which it was borne up, of the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And you can imagine him just feeling out telling that little boy to run for his life and feeling out. And all he needs to do now is, is to get hold of these things and he's determined in his mind and he prays with all of his heart to his God, give me your strength just this once. And he takes hold, the word there means to twist. It's like he twists his body on these two things. And he cries out and he says, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself with all of his might. 
He bows himself and it would be Solomon later in Proverbs 7. Remember when that young man, she, her, her speech causes him to yield. That's the word bow. That young man would bow at the feet of that woman and it's what he did with Delilah, wasn't it? On his knees, he bowed to her and she took his heart. And now he bows before his God. He's had time to think. He bows with all of his might. And in this moment, you know God is number one. Why is God number one? Because Samson now gives God back his heart and his soul and his strength, does he not? Because out of the mouth, the abundance of the heart is known, as the Lord Jesus Christ said. And that's where his prayers come from, his heart. He's going to give his soul because he's going to give his life to his God. And he bows with all his strength. God has taken the rightful place, the number one place in his life. And now he bows with all his might. And you can see the man pushing there. And to his great relief, brothers and sisters, his prayer is heard. And he feels those pillars move just that little bit. You imagine the feeling that washed over him in that moment with a great struggle and it would move and fall and chaos would reign in that building, wouldn't it? As one would knock into the other before people even realised what was going on. The fires are overturned, there's people running everywhere, thousands of people screaming and crying as, as the great platforms above on the roof would slide down into the main arena crushing hundreds and thousands of people. And our hero lies dead underneath all of that rubble, brothers and sisters. So the dead which he slew at his death were more than they which he slew in his life. And that's the end of the life of that man, Samson. It says then his brethren... And all the house of his father came down and took him. And they brought him up. And where did they bring him? They brought him to the place where it all began. Between Zorah and Eshtahol. It's where the story started. In the burying place of Manoah, his father. And Samson is brought home. He comes home. And he's buried next to his father, whose name means rest. He's at rest for the time, isn't he? What does Hebrews 11 say about the man that we've considered this weekend? Well, if I was to paraphrase paraphrase just a few verses together, this is what Paul records of this man that we've considered. And what shall I say more, he says, for the time would fail me to tell of Samson, who through faith stopped lying, He escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness was made strong, who waxed valiant in fight, of whom the world was not worthy. And he, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having foreseen something better for us, that only together with us he will be made perfect. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but At the end, I I often wonder what would have been said as they laid Samson to rest. Perhaps it was what was said at the end of that Nazarite vow. The Lord has blessed you, Samson, and he's kept you. The Lord made his face to shine on him, did he not? He was gracious unto him. The Lord lifted up his countenance on him. And a day is coming, brothers and sisters, not too far away, where he will be given peace.